Muy buenos días, bienvenidos a nuestra sexta conferencia de este ciclo Cultura Visual y Material, Aproximaciones Multidisciplinarias al Espacio Urbano. Este encuentro también es coordinado por el doctor Sergio Miranda Pacheco. Agradezco al Instituto de Investigaciones Históricas, a los ingenieros Alfredo y Alonso y a Carmen Fragano por su apoyo en esta emisión. Hoy tendremos la participación de Charlotte Mather de la Universidad de Zúrich. Eh, la maestra Mather nos compartirá un análisis sobre la obra de arte Fluvio Subtunal de la artista Lea Lublin, realizada en 1969 en Argentina. En su presentación, la maestra Mater nos explicará cómo es que el plástico, entre otras cuestiones, cuestiona la relación entre el hombre, la naturaleza y la tecnología. Antes de escuchar la conferencia, presentaré la semblanza de nuestra invitada. Charlotte Mather es asistente de investigación y docencia en el Instituto de Historia del Arte de la Universidad de Zúrich, donde coordina la maestría especializada en Historia del Arte en el contexto global. Actualmente realiza un doctorado en el cual explora el uso del plástico en las prácticas artísticas durante las décadas de 1960 y 1970, con enfoque en las perspectivas feministas. En los años 2019 y 2020, fue becaria en la Biblioteca Gerciana, el Instituto Max Planck de Historia del Arte y el Instituto Esbizero de Roma. Ha publicado múltiples ensayos en catálogos de exposiciones y es coeditora del libro Into the Wild, Art and Architecture in a Global Context del 2018. Welcome, Professor Charlotte Matter. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation. We'll listen to you. Thank you so much, Fabiola, for inviting me and also for accepting uh, that I give this talk uh, in English. So I will begin by sharing my screen. All right. So my paper will discuss an installation by Lea Lublin, an artist based between Buenos Aires and Paris, entitled Fluvio Subtunal, that was installed in Santa Fe on the occasion of the opening of a subfluvial tunnel in December 1969. The anagram in my own title refers on the one hand to the title of Lublin's intervention, her so-called Fluvio Subtunal inverted the term Tunnel Subfluvial. On the other hand, I argue that the anagram may be understood as a method that runs through different aspects of this work and speaks to its materiality, namely the many kinds of plastics used. Lublin began working with plastics after turning away from painting in the 1960s. Her use of plastics was both eclectic and short-lived. It spanned a period of a few years from her first works using layered sheets of plexiglass in 1967 to her environments employing polystyrene, penetrable plastic curtains, and soft inflatable structures between 69 and 71. The various plastics that Lublin used around that time served her to question the patriarchal order of society and to challenge, in some cases, the, repress the repressive dictatorship in Argentina. However, because these works dealt with supposedly trivial topics, such as motherhood, leisure, and play, and because they employed everyday materials, their critical dimension was often missed. Turning away from a traditional elitist understanding of art, Lublin believed, quote, that every artistic work should be a social, cultural, and therefore political work, end of quote. She sought to engage a broad audience with her works. In this context, her choice of material played a decisive role. Neither particularly valuable nor bound to the history of art, plastics were accessible materials, familiar from everyday life. In this sense, as I will argue, they were particularly suitable materials for representing reality. Plastics have been historically associated with being fake as materials that were initially developed to replace other materials found in nature. 
Yet plastics have never existed outside of nature, since they are produced from all base components and thus from natural, raw materials. Along these lines, Lea Lublin inverted the preconception of plastics as being artificial and unreal and used them precisely to address the real and the everyday. In what follows, I will consider how she engaged with the city and its population by responding to a newly built work of infrastructure that transformed the urban quotidian, namely the massive underwater tunnel that connected the cities of Santa Fe and Paraná, and moreover the region with the rest of Argentina and its neighboring countries. Fluvio Subtunal was commissioned for the inauguration of the underwater car tunnel. The tunnel was, at the time, the largest construction work in Argentina and the first of its kind in South America. It was the result of decades of political debate about whether a bridge or a tunnel should be preferred. Accordingly, when the tunnel was finally unveiled on December 13, 1969, the inauguration was staged in a media effective manner and accompanied by numerous public events, including a presidential visit of General Juan Carlos Onganilla for the ceremonial ribbon cutting. However, despite all the efforts of the authorities, to stage the opening of the tunnel as a large collective celebration. Some reports suggest that the fervor of the population was limited. Reporting on the inauguration events, the magazine Periscopio, for instance, remarked how, quote, there were on both sides on the river, speeches, blessings, and bronze mementos, an excess of surveillance and a faint popular enthusiasm, end of quote. Against the background of the state-ordered celebrations of a military dictatorship, Lublin's Fluvio Subtunal stood out as a playful breathing space. Perhaps the most striking feature of Fluvio Subtunal, besides its immersive and participatory nature, was the plethora of materials used, including numerous kinds of plastics. The artist's choice of materials was by no means accidental. Plastics were in fact a key element in the construction of the underwater tunnel. Because the tunnel pipes made from reinforced concrete needed waterproofing, their entire outer surface had to be coated with a mixture of synthetic resins and fiberglass. As the trade journal Plasticos estimated in a 1966 report, around 480 tons of polyester resin, 60 tons of glass fiber, and 30 tons of styrene monomer would be used altogether for the tunnel construction. And a team of over 30 people was specially employed for the plastic impermeabilization. According to Plasticos, this large assignment for this prestigious tunnel construction was, quote, an excellent opportunity to confirm the applications and possibilities of plastic and to demonstrate that great and historical works such as this rely on its valuable and positive contribution, end of quote. Fluvio Subtunal was installed in the ground floor of a vacant building in Santa Fe. Lublin divided the spacious premises of 900 square meters into nine successive zones. The route was apparently detailed in a flyer to avoid losses and detours within the maze-like environment, according to one press report. So let me guide you through. Fluvio Subtunal began with La Fuente where visitors, in order to enter the venue, had to step on cubes that emerged from a pond in the outside entrance area, within which inflated plastic cushions were floating. According to the artist's project description, the next section was accessed through foam rubber ramps or a trampoline. Once inside, visitors found themselves in the Zona de los Vientos, 
They had to push their way through elongated, inflated plastic tubes in different translucent shades hanging from the ceiling. These air columns, as Lublin called them, were supposed to be in constant motion through intermittent ventilators. In order to access the next Sona Tecnologica, visitors passed through a translucent plastic curtain. Photographs of the workers who had constructed the tunnel were projected on the curtain, creating an immersive environment that was also a tribute to the immense workforce involved and gave visibility to the otherwise invisible anonymous workers. Immediately after, 15 television monitors showed what was happening simultaneously at other points of the installation. Stacked on top of another, their display was evocative of video surveillance systems that gained currency in the 1960s. Furthermore, the temporary scaffolds they were arranged on and the cables sticking out of the ceiling in the background conveyed the impression of a provisional construction area reminiscent of the actual tunnel's perennial building site. The following Zona de Producción to be seen in the background of the image to the right, created the notion of work in the artist's words by providing mixing machine along with different natural and artificial materials, dirt, lime, sand, stones, and polystyrene for the visitors to mix and construct forms. Visitors then passed the Zona Sensorial an enclosed space with black light and sensory stimuli, including life buoys from transparent plastic filled with fluorescent colored water placed on white polystyrene plinths. After this dark sensory zone, visitors could interact in the zona de descarga with inflated polyethylene objects shaped like rabbits. Eventually came the centerpiece, Fluvio Subtunal, a large, penetrable, inflated plastic tube of 20 meters length that gave the entire project its name. Of great importance for the project was that the tunnel be made of translucent material. In this way, Lublin was able to connect the inside with the outside and provide views from both sides a fact she also highlighted in her project description. Lublin reversed the term tunnel subfluvial and invented the anagram fluvio subtunnel to create a rainbow colored conduit filled with obstacles, inflated plastic balls in different shapes and colors, and ankle high water that was conceived as a fictional and dysfunctional replica of the underwater passageway. The conduit itself was situated within the Zona de la Naturaleza, while certain parts of the floor were covered with soil. Other areas were, were sprinkled over with white polystyrene beads. The juxtaposition of soil and polystyrene caused again a tension between natural and artificial materials, which resonated with other parts of the circuit. The notion of nature was furthermore conveyed in this zone through a few sparsely distributed potted plants and some live animals enclosed by a loose fence made of wooden branches. Last came the Zona de la Participación Creadora, which consisted in some shooting galleries. With this finale, the artist poked fun at the conventions of art exhibitions and turned her installation into a festive fairground. The targets to be shot at were vaguely reminiscent of abstract painting. Teasingly, Lublin invited the visitors to participate creatively in her work by shooting at pictures, thus encouraging them to perform an iconoclastic act. Quite possibly, Lublin was also referring here to Niki de saint Phalle's series of Tir, realized in the early 1960s, in which the artist would shoot at her own works using a rifle or pistol. 
According to the French critic Pierre Restani, who saw Fluvio Subtunal shortly before its opening, quote, the people of Santa Fe had embraced Lea Lublin's undertaking. It was part of their world, the celebration of their tunnel, end of quote. Likewise, Isabel Plante has later observed that, quote, Fluvio Subtunal was conceived for a city whose urban structure and everyday habits, organized to a great extent around the Paraná River, were profoundly affected by the construction of the Hernandarias tunnel, end of quote. Lublin's installation drew from the immediate reality of the local population and offered them a central, playful tour along various topics related to the tunnel, literally merging art and life, as announced on the colored strips of paper that served as a wallpaper in one corner of Fluvio Subtunal, where transparent plastic pillows were lying on the floor, filled with partly colored, partly foaming water. Lublin's choice of soft inflatable plastics for this environment was guided by the desire to address and involve the local population. Restani, in fact, described Fluvio Subtunal as a sociological demonstration. And Lublin later described how her choice of materials was, was generally, quote, determined according to the necessities of what I propose, claiming that she had used inflatables and transparent colored plastics, quote, to motivate the public into participating in a real event taking place in town, end of quote. Along these lines, she apparently understood plastics as accessible and inclusive materials, presumably based on their association with the everyday. In fact, plastics have often been understood as democratic materials with regard to their accessibility in terms of price and their mass distribution in contrast to rarer, more valuable materials. During the press conference before the opening, Lublin suggested that Fluvio Subtunal was, quote, something parallel to reality, emphasizing the link between her intervention and the actual tunnel. And she described the work as a, quote, poetic situation, such as the inversion of reality, end of quote. Elsewhere, she reasserted that the, quote, inversion of reality allows the aesthetic experience to become vital, unquote. This understanding was echoed in the press reviews, with one report characterizing the artwork as an antithesis of the work of engineering, and another calling it a sort of anti-tunnel. Continuing this line of thought, I argue that Fluvio Subtunal was based on the principle of the anagram, starting with the title, through the dysfunctional plastic tunnel that was filled with water instead of leading underwater, to the representation of nature by means of artificial materials. I therefore suggest that one could read the entire installation in reverse. For instance, as the magazine Analysis remarked, the space created by Lublin belongs to those non-ordinary and magical of fun fairs. Indeed, an essential aspect of Fluvio Subtunal was the rupture with everyday life, the literal extraordinary. In terms of an anagram, the fun fair atmosphere could be understood as an oblique allusion to the gloomy political context and the sense of playful leisure as a reference in reverse to the laborious work on the tunnel. Reading Fluvio Subtunal as an anagram furthermore helps to understand how this work explored the frictions and junctions between city and river, plastics and organic materials, technology and nature. Lublin explained before the opening how her intervention explored, quote, the possibility of integrating oneself as a living organism 
into the world where technology is the complement of nature, like the tunnel, unquote. Elsewhere, she also noted how the work departed from, quote, the opposition of the concepts of nature and technology, unquote. And she later described this environment as a parallel nature. Likewise, Restani also underscored the juxtaposition of, quote, nature in itself and nature for itself in Fluvio Subtunal, of the ontological given of the universe and natura naturans, and of the objective reality and the product of human activity, end of quote. Lublin's Fluvio Subtunal played with the juxtaposition of nature and artificiality, or rather human intervention in nature, by means of the media and materials used. Lublin referred to the plastic tubes in the wind zone as air columns. Elsewhere, she described them as a sort of forest. She thus used plastics to suggest natural phenomena such as wind or trees. On the other hand, certain elements from nature serve to point back to technology. With the water that flowed through the central plastic tunnel, the artist took up the idea of the closed circuit and applied it to the element of water. And water is in fact commonly used as an analogy for electricity. What is more, according to Lublin's plan, the water within the tunnel was meant to flow constantly and to be connected by a closed circuit system with the fountain at the entrance. This in turn alluded to the closed circuit monitors, which transmitted the events and monitored the visitors within the installation by means of cameras installed along the itinerary, displaying images that were both real in the sense of live and unreal in the sense of virtual. White cloud-shaped panels made from polystyrene hung from the light blue painted walls and from the ceiling above and around the plastic tunnel. Just as these clouds seemed to have sprung from a picture book rather than actually try to imitate real clouds, the nature that gave this zone its name was primarily a schematic representation of it. Numerous artists actually employed plastics at the time precisely to articulate a not alienated or otherwise disrupted relationship with nature. In Italy, Gino Marotta, for instance, created trees and animals from translucent colored perspex contrasting naturalistic forms with artificial colors and materials. Marotta later pointed out that his works were both produced and presented like advertisement, making them a sort of commodified nature. In a forest of mint installed at Galleria Tartaruga in Rome in 1968, Marotta hung dazzling green plastic strings from the ceiling that could be traversed. Additionally, a mint aroma was diffused in the air and mint flavored sweets and spirits were offered to the visitors, turning this installation into a multi-sensory celebration of nature as artifice. Likewise, artists like Tetsumi Kudo or Luis Fernando Benedit used plastics to create condensed and enclosed models of nature, both living and inanimate, which alluded to the aesthetics of the laboratory. All these artists understood plastics as part of their environment and reality. In the late 1960s, Plastics already belong to a novel notion of nature after nature. It was therefore no contradiction for Lublin to claim, quote, I want to produce a parallel nature for the viewer to come into contact with reality itself, end of quote. In conclusion, Lublin's use of plastics aimed at the exact opposite of the conventional associations with this material, commonly dismissed as the epitome of mimicry, cheap counterfeit and deception. 
and as the antithesis of genuine primordial nature. Her persistent juxtaposition of polymers with organic substances, such as earth, water, live animals and people, emphatically highlights the artificiality of these materials. In her works, however, it is precisely plastics which function as illuminative instruments to grasp realities, making visible the otherwise invisible. The material's artificiality therefore serves to deconstruct the hegemony of supposedly natural substances in terms of authenticity and to reveal the construction of reality. Thank you very much, Charlotte, for this insightful analysis about plastics in a contemporary uh, landscape. So we are going to wait for the audience participation. Eh, a la audiencia que nos acompaña por el canal de YouTube, los invito a enviarnos sus participaciones. Eh, la maestra Mate responderá en inglés. Este, nos pueden escribir en inglés o en español. Eh, si es en español, yo intentaré hacer la traducción más cercana. So Charlotte, in the meantime, we wait for the audience uh, participation. I want to ask you if you know a little bit more or further about the visitor's reaction when they go, were going through these environments. Yes, so uh, unfortunately, I should start with saying that um, there is rather little archival material that is preserved um, about this work because it was, um, well, it was organized uh, by the Instituto Torquato di Teia, uh, but uh, it, since it was not in Buenos Aires, but it took place uh, in this vacant building in Santa Fe, um, there is rather little that is preserved in their archives uh, in Buenos Aires. Um, and so um, I can only base my understanding of the visitors' um, uh, understanding of the work on the press reviews, uh, which I was able to, uh, to access, and on the um, photographs. And um, from telling from both, uh, I can only say that it must have been a, a, a huge success with the audience. Uh, it really seems, um, well, you can really see people enjoying themselves uh, in the installation. Um, and some uh, press reports are even, um, well, even go that far as to muse whether people really understood this as a kind of art. So there's this uh, interesting relation between artwork and uh, leisure fun fair playground that is uh, being kind of addressed and challenged by the artist on purpose uh, and that actually seemed to work and seem to um, disturb a little certain reviewers. Uh, but I would say that um, on the side of the audience, it was uh, a, a big success. Um, maybe I can also add to this that um, the whole installation was in fact funded uh, by Alpi, which was, uh, well, it still exists. Um, and it's uh, an organization against uh, infantile paralysis. And um, certainly one of their aims was also to make uh, the whole installation uh, quite available. So there were, for instance, uh, there was an entry fee that uh, had to be paid to enter the installation, but uh, prices were reduced for children, for instance. Um, so it's certainly no coincidence that we see a lot of children enjoying themselves uh, in, the, in, the, in the work. Yeah, it is very interesting that this is a participatory environment and it reminds me to the big amusement parks in which there are uh, plastics, uh, games made of plastics. It is very interesting. So I'm going to share you, with you the audience comments and questions. Juan Carlos Martinez Guzman says, congratulations for your presentation. And he asked if you can explain a bit further about the, how the artists obtain the materials and the economic 
uh, funds to develop the, art, the work of art. Yes, yes. So, um, so yes. So as I was um, uh, saying just now, the funds came uh, mainly through Alpi. Uh, so it was actually um, also their idea from the beginning. So you, we should understand there was this uh, huge initiative um, for the opening of the tunnel. And then there was La Semana del Tunnel with a lot of uh, uh, cultural events, also sports events. There were boxing matches and uh, swimming contests um, and also um, different exhibitions. And so Alpi um, approached uh, the Instituto Torquato di Teia to um, consider whether they could realize uh, a site-specific work for the opening of the tunnel. And since uh, Torquato di Teia, they were um, at the time precisely working with Lea Lublin, who had just recently um, installed um, similar environments in Buenos Aires in their um, main seat. Uh, they thought of uh, asking Lea Lublin. And uh, the funds came uh, then through Alpi, and they all in return uh, received the entrance fees um, of, the, of the show. And then um, there were well, the, all the materials. Uh, it was a huge, actually, this, this participatory um, aspect of the work is very interesting because it already starts in the preparation. So to uh, it, uh, obtain all the materials that were used, um, the, um, uh, the artist helped by uh, Paolo Antonio, who was uh, from the Torquato di Teia, um, they um, sought to collaborate with many firms that were in Santa Fe. So they had a lot of sponsors. Um, they had sponsors in terms of ma the materials that were uh, given to use, uh, but they also had a lot of uh, sponsors in terms of uh, collaboration. So a lot of uh, people who were helping um, and doing work that was uh, actually a, a benevolent uh, work. Thank you very much for your answer, Charlotte. Uh, Antonio asks, if there is a critique about the plastic sustainability and, there, and if it is uh, considered in the artist's work. Yes, thank you. That's also another very great uh, question. It's actually what uh, initially started my interest in plastics uh, and uh, the use of plastics in artworks of the 1960s, because uh, obviously from today's perspective, uh, I was uh, kind of puzzled uh, by the many artists who were using plastics at the time. Uh, and I was wondering, well, I thought there must be some relationship uh, with the environment. Um, then during my research, I had to learn that, um, that actually these concerns came a little later. So uh, the realization that plastics are, uh, um, are uh, toxic for the environment came uh, around the late 60s uh, and really I would say in the mainstream rather in the early 70s. So it actually didn't really play a role at, at that time. Um, obviously there is um, certain, there, there are certain reflections uh, in other artists uh, like the work of Tetsumi Kudo um, whom I was uh, showing briefly before. But uh, I think with Lea Lublin and many, many other artists at the time, it's still, um, it, it is still not really uh, a topic, but it may have uh, also played a role in the fact that Lublin then stopped entirely working with plastics in the early 70s. So uh, even though I don't have uh, proof of this, uh, I think it is um, very possible uh, that uh, this realization that really came uh, at this point may have also play, played a role. 
So she and many other artists really stopped uh, using those materials then in the early 70s. Okay, so according to this work of art, could you say that plastics has been one of those materials that have blurred uh, the distinction between nature and culture? Yeah, so yeah, blurred, we, we could say so because um, they are perceived as absolutely artificial because yeah, they are created in a laboratory, right? They are not raw materials like wood or stone, like the classic uh, art materials. Um, and uh, and they also their, their aesthetics is uh, very artificial in the sense that they do not resemble anything uh, that we may encounter in, in uh, nature uh, as such. But then again, um, they are in fact based on uh, so-called natural components. And also um, they, really, they really became part of our, of our nature, so, so to speak. So um, yes, uh, I would say that they, they blurred these lines, yes. Yeah, because, you know, I was thinking about concrete and making a comparison and concrete talks about more a controlling, a control over nature. And that doesn't happen with, uh, with plastics. Plastic seems more to be a second skin. And now we can consider part of, of the nature. As you can say now, it is considered an, an accessible and democratic uh, material. And I think that there is no another artificial material that has the same meaning nowadays. Yes, I, I really like this idea of concrete as a controlling material. Um, and I think it's quite, well, I, I don't know if it's funny, but um, in a sense, <coughs> in a way, plastics has also become a controlling material in the sense that today it controls our environment by uh, being such um, a toxic substance that is um, uh, clotting our uh, oceans. Um, but uh, yes, it's, it's very different. It's, plastics is much more, there was one exhibition uh, which called the mutant materials. That's also maybe a useful term um, as opposed to controlling, right? So may, more this, uh, something that is not really graspable, that is, uh, because in fact, plastics are really plastic in the sense, uh, really in, in the sense of the word, that they can uh, have many different appearances. Plastics is a very general word that can mean um, materials that are transparent, but also opaque, that are uh, hard or soft, that are rigid or flexible. Um, so it's an entire family. And it's, there's nothing really that, that we can grasp, but nevertheless, we all kind of know what we are talking about when we use the word plastic. So, yeah. Yeah, there is a very different aesthetic, but the, as you say, the use is very similar. At, at the end, it is a, a material of control. So Antonio Gutierrez asks you, so plastic can be seen as the final material to build, to build a border between the organized cities and the chaos of nature? Uh, that's a good question. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed too. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, because there's, there's, there's something of both, I think, in plastics, because they are, uh, as I was saying, because they are so not graspable, uh, I think they can have both. And they can, also, they can also pretend to belong to the world of the city, to the, to the more controlled world. They can also be used in a building, for instance but they can also pretend to belong rather to, to nature. So, so maybe they can be both depending on how they are used also by, by different artists and architects for that matter. 
Yeah, I think that's a, a, a very interesting point of uh, plastics because as you say, we can use it in a daily items very close to our lives. And it also can be used in a large engineering or perhaps architecture problem um, projects. And I think that that makes a big difference between other art industrial materials. Yes, yes, it's, it's much more related to our everyday uh, than other um, industrial materials. I totally agree. It's so present and we also have to imagine, I mean, obviously today they still are, but today um, uh, many designers are also trying to avoid plastics. So they are using bottles that are made uh, again of glass or bottles that are made of wood uh, or whatever. <laughs> But when talking about the 60s, so the period that I'm looking at, this is really, it's really the time of plastics everywhere. It's really the plastic age uh, where every gadget, every single thing uh, in your everyday interior, um, in your surroundings will be made of plastics. It's, uh, it's really something that you cannot escape at the time. Exactly. That's very interesting. I have another question. Uh, this work of art, Fluvius Subtuna, has been recently displayed. Yes, it has been uh, in a, at a brilliant retrospective of Lea Lublin in Munich. So it has been uh, reconstructed, uh, which is always uh, something that is uh, very difficult to do. And I think um, the curator Stephanie Weber, who, who is really a brilliant curator, she really did a fantastic job in, in trying also to reinterpret uh, the work and uh, adapting it to, um, to the new situation. Because obviously there is no kind of fetish of the original material because all the materials are, are gone. So you need to recreate uh, the entire thing with new materials. Um, and so it's, uh, it's, it's nothing that is, uh, it's, it's nothing easy. Um, but uh, I think it was as, as well, uh, uh, well, obviously it was different in that context because it was in a museum uh, and not uh, in a, and not in a in a space that was reused for a temporary uh, project. And also, obviously, Lea Lublin by that time was, uh, a, but she was already then an established artist. But by now, she has really become a, a canonized artist, if I may say so. So there is obviously a different meaning in entering um, the, same, the same work, but it is interesting to, to think about the possibility to reproduce such uh, works that were ephemeral uh, in the beginning. Great. Yeah, I have a question about that because I want to ask you that if you think that the new materials used in this new exhibition have changed the meaning of the work of art. Well, the new materials, I mean, they are very similar materials. Uh, it's so. So I don't. I don't think no. Uh, and I think the artist herself, um, she wouldn't have. She wouldn't have laid um, much emphasis on the. Well, on the material, yes, obviously, I wouldn't <laughs> be talking about the materials, else, uh, but. Um, not on the on this specific material. So she was interested in the more, let's say, in the materiality of plastics and what they meant, but not uh, in this specific object. Um, so in the preserving, actually, I mean, these works were also very fragile, we must also say. So um, she gave also instructions um, <coughs> when the the tunnel was uh, reconstructed in, in uh, Medellin um, for the Biennale de Coltejer. Uh, and she gave very um, specific instructions that people should enter only barefoot and that the floor should be very clean because uh, um, obviously the foil was very thin. And so it was easily, it would easily break. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think uh, it changed the meaning. And I think she would 
she would have been uh, totally okay to, to recreate the work with new materials, um, as long as it's uh, retained the original uh, feeling and meaning. Okay, thanks, Charlotte. So I am going to give you my, my comments about your presentation. I really like and appreciate how you explain the politics of plastics, as you say, by commercial means, it has become an accessible, an accessible and democratic material. We all understand that. And also it has changed our perception of nature. Uh, how we have an interaction in artificial or natural environments. So uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Charlotte, if you want to add something else. No, I don't think. I mean, I really, I really enjoyed uh, the questions that were asked. I must say, uh, uh, and I think it will really give me, give me uh, further thoughts. So, so thank you so much uh, for all, for all these uh, great questions. Uh, thanks, thanks to you, Charlotte, for those insightful analyses and your answers. Uh, so, I think that we don't don't have more comments and questions. So on behalf of, of the Institute of Re Historical Research and Dr. Sergio Miranda, I thank you a lot for your participation. And I hope we can still continue working together. Y a toda la audiencia que nos acompañó por el canal de YouTube, también les agradezco mucho su asistencia y participación. Los invito muy cordialmente a nuestra sexta conferencia que será el próximo jueves y será dictada por el Dr. Sergio Miranda. Él realizará un análisis sobre el espacio de Tlatelolco relacionado con su historia, memoria e identidades. Muchas gracias a todos los que nos acompañaron y al equipo técnico del Instituto de Investigaciones Estéticas y a Carmen Fragano que recibió sus comentarios por el canal de YouTube. Muchas gracias a todos y hasta la próxima semana. Gracias.